Caregivers, have you ever felt like nothing is going right? Well, cheer up and welcome to Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver Radio Program, where you'll learn how to avoid that dreaded thing called caregiver burnout and how to survive the grieving process. Join Dave and his guests now as they share practice tips and tools that you can start using immediately to help get you through this day. Now, here's your caregiver host, Dave Nassani. From Los Angeles, and not New York today, because Adrian is not able to be with us today. But a big L.A. welcome anyway, and a big Apple welcome. What the heck to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver at caregiverdave.com. And i uh, got to tell you that we're coming to you live 24-7 on Facebook Live, but also on 17 global audio video platforms, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, Stitcher, Blog Talk Radio, Mixcloud, Listen Notes, Blueberry, Player FM, Podcast.com, VIP Internet Radio, Facebook Live, HealthyLife.net, and CaregiverDave.com. And i got to tell you, we have an exciting show planned for you today. Alexander Belechko. I think I said that Fantastic right. Fantastic to be here. <laughs> See, he's, he's really here. Number one best-selling author and award-winning speaker at the Harvard Club. Um, I got to tell you that uh, he is a, an amazing speaker. I was at the Harvard Club hearing him, and he is also uh, speaking or has spoken at Nasdaq, Coca-Cola, Mercedes-Benz, West Point. Alexander is the SEO or genius <laughs> CEO of digital marketing agency triple agent digital media and creator of the abc's of marketing formula um i think we have the same publicist because uh, i seem to follow him around wherever he goes so i'm in good <laughs> <laughs> but before we get started um uh, also want to introduce uh, his dad in a moment because he is the reason we're here. If it wasn't for his dad, Alexander would not be the genius that he is. He would still be a genius, but he would not have the the outlets and the opportunities. So uh, another American story of the parents sacrificing for the children. Isn't that amazing? Only in America, yeah. right? But before we get started, I want to thank uh, last week's guest. Carol Novello is the founder of Mutual Rescue, a national initiative that highlights the connection between people and pets. Mutual Rescue's first film, Eric and Petey, went viral around the world and has been viewed more than 100 million times. How'd you like to have a video like that, Alexander? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. So I got to tell you, uh, just a reminder, that video and um, interview can be listened, uh, just like all of ours, inst including this one, on our membership website, caregiverdave.com, or on any of those 17 global networks that I mentioned earlier. All right, enough of that. Welcome to the show, Alexander and Arcady. Yeah. Arcady. Yay. In case you didn't know, I'm so excited to have you on. Uh, why don't you take a minute or two? I'll give you both... Uh, uh, a minute or two to introduce yourself. I like to ask my guests, just who is Alexander? Who is Arcady? And why were they put on this earth? Go ahead. You first, Alexander. Yeah. Well, what can I say? It is great to be here. It is great to be here. And if it, again, if it were not for my dad, I wouldn't be the SEO genius that I am today. We have a lot of stories to tell, a lot of life-changing events that have led me to where I really am now, being a computer user since I was two, and how I transmuted that, how I really transmuted that, and took, took all, took, you know, made the, made the most of family tragedies, and how we're really integrating that into what we do as a business today, and we're about to talk about we're about to talk about caregiving for special needs children and right. how to overcome a family tragedy. Well, and how about you, Arcady? Great answer. Well, I yes. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for having us, Dave, in here. And um, well, I don't have as much exciting probably stories as Alexander because yeah. he's the one who's been speaking on stages and everybody's referred to it, but you know, 
one thing that uh, one time we were at the um, um, restaurant, um, somebody took me out and uh, the lady comes over to the table and say, hey, are you Alexander, Alexander is dead? I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't happen that often. Uh, I did came to uh, did come to Canada in 1992, and um, so since then I've been working uh, food manufacturing, sharing uh, well a lot of messages with a lot of people. And uh, due to some of the circumstances that uh, we will be talking on this show, um, we that's how we ended up. Um, no, I ended up investing into my son that into his bright future so and i hope that he would help me <laughs> <laughs> yes now one hand washes the other doesn't it yes we have a we have a collective mission of helping great people and change makers to thrive wow that sounds like a great mission statement so i can totally relate arcady because um i'm often known as the husband of charlene my wife because yeah. she is really the great one, especially now because, you know, she had a stroke, lost her speech, paralyzed on the right side, and she makes all of us people look like whiners and complainers, and she accomplishes more than than people who have use of both their limbs and, and can speak, and uh, she can do it uh, eloquently with her own handicap, and we're in the process of... Uh, having our documentary film now, and she's just shining on the screen. And so have you had a chance to meet her? Uh, no, no. But you, no, will, meet, you no. will meet her at Carnegie Hall. So, Wow, that's cool. And cool about, I mean, congratulations on your documentary, David. Thank you. You know, I always tell people that my wife is amazing. She's like a cross between Martha Stewart and Wonder Woman. And, and then in September, she's going to actually meet Martha Stewart. And who knows what will come from that meeting, and so we'll get pictures that's, together and everything. As that's we cool. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Uh, Clint has really outdone himself. <laughs> yes. Um, and Clint is the person who has made all of these speaking uh, arrangements possible. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I've been on 25 morning shows all across the country, and uh, Alexander uh, has spoken on uh, stages uh, everywhere, prestigious stages. Anyway, back to uh, Alexander. An early special needs challenge, uh, caring for Alexander, that defined how you raised him growing up. He was a, uh, uh, a special needs challenge, wasn't he? Uh, why was he different from any other special needs child, uh, Arcady? Uh, well, uh, you know, yeah, one thing, I mean, I'll tell you that all the time, I, I was working all the time, and um, I would come home and I would always question Francine. I said, why is he so skinny and he's got this, you know, he's got a stomach like, kind of like, you know, protruding a little bit. Like if those starving children in Africa, right? That's it. This is your that's, wife you're I, talking about, uh, Francine. Yes, this is, yeah, yeah, her name, yes, her name, Francine, yes. And um, I said, oh, no, he just eats this and this. I said, yeah, it's nothing unusual. Oatmeal and this and that, and um, we could never figure it out. Now, one thing already then that came up that he would not be able to stay kind of calm or in his atmosphere, and his environment, if he would not have three sources running at the same time. It's TV, computer, and the radio. Wow. So one day I bought those sweeties in the box. You know, you for the uh, serials, right? Yeah. We were watching TV, and Alexander Chump, maybe, I don't know, a quarter of the box or something like that. Uh, next morning, I go to work, and um, I get a phone call from from C and say, hey, listen, you've got to get out, get over right now, and we have okay. to take him to the emergency. I said, what's happening? I said, he's in pain, his stomach is you know, extended, and all that, whatever comes with the childhood, right? I said, wow, okay. So we took him over and uh, a young doctor at the walk-in clinic because we did not have, um, it was a, sh it's a shortage of uh, family doctors, right? And we're kind of living in the halfway boonies. He said, did you ever check him for the, uh, for the gluten allergy? And I'm like, oh, and the light bulb came on because half a year prior to it, I read an article in our, one of the local, um, 
not the local, it was a central newspaper, Star, about a person, her name, Ellen Gottschall. I hope I'm saying it right. And uh, her, um, her book was uh, called Breaking the Vicious Cycle. And she went on to explain that people with these uh, problems uh, may um, get benefit from going on the almond-based diet. And I'm like, boom. So that was half a year prior to all this happening. Not that it hasn't been happening, but it's just when it came to a culmination that, hey, I had to take him to the emergency. So we went on the almond-based diet. And, you know, I mean, those days, still now, I mean, it's expensive. It's like, what well, okay. So we are just north of Toronto. You're buying, um, uh, it's 17 to $18 a pound. So it was like a golden one. But anyhow, what came from it all, that uh, two weeks after we put him on this big diet, so it's not just gluten-free diet. The diet is called a CD, a specific carbohydrate diet. And uh, so we use that book. There is also a site by the same name, Breaking the Vicious Cycle. And we follow it from then. So that was the year was 2006, I believe. And that's when we put him on that diet. And I would say everything changed. Now that we still had to take him off either radio or TV one, one source at a time, which was... <laughs> Which was really bad. <laughs> and we yeah. can, you know. <clears throat> but that's, that's when it came down to that we realized that, you know, perhaps we got the challenge in our hands, but we would, you know, never, um, we would always persevere and yeah. never give up. And one thing was also while he was still at his early stage that we took him to the doctor. I don't remember he was two or three, right? And the doctor asked, so, well, is he talking? I'm like, well, I mean, if we're talking like with Francine, no, no he doesn't. He's just blabbering something. <laughs> uh -huh. Right? I mean, he doesn't talk like us. It's again, you know, it's all, they're looking at all these uh, graphs. They're looking at all these percentiles. I said, mm -hmm. and we just look at each other. I said, no, he doesn't. Well, he's got a problem. You have to take him to the speech therapist. I said, what? <laughs> Anyhow, I mean, now he talks, he cannot stop it. <laughs> <laughs> So what, is your, what is your perspective, Alexander, of, of that time frame, that time period that he just mentioned? What do you remember? What are your earliest uh, recollection, recollections and thoughts? How old were you? My earliest recollection, recollections, I would say probably when I, were when I was like two years old. Wow. And, a lot of, and a lot of my memories have to do with my computer education, right? Because <laughs> I was raised, because from the very beginning, a lot of my early childhood education took place on computers. <clears throat> I have a lot of very fond memories of my parents, and I know that, I know that <clears throat> Francine and Francine, my mom and our Katie, dad, they personally taught me to see the best in myself. They taught me to see the greatness in myself. And while I've, I've learned a lot over the years, and I would say that since then, that is one of the things that has really made sense. Parents, I mean, the story that Arcady just told about the, about the doctor saying that, oh, Alexander, you need to go see a speech therapist. Well, the thing is, while not everyone can escape it, one of the big lessons, one of my big takeaways from that experience is that it's important to be aware that medical professionals are not necessarily there to see the greatness in your own children. This is the lesson for the caregivers. They aren't always, the medical professionals are not always there to see the greatness in your own children. They are there to label them. And that is creating and imposing a limiting belief on their own growth, on their development, right. and limiting them in their success in their life. So it is important to embrace the power of positive thinking and teach that to your own children because that's one of the biggest things that I was taught when I was growing up. And I can, and while I've had my share of uh, had my share of anger management challenges and making mom and dad yell and scream in the, a lot of the lessons that they've a lot of the lessons that they've taught me, and especially and especially how they got me on the diet diet early on, which is so which is one of the smartest things they ever did. Oh. They have helped me to become the person 
that I am today. Did the speech therapist help at all? Uh, we never we, went to them. We, no. we never went to the speech therapist. Uh, our speech therapist, you know, I mean, uh, it's a little bit, uh, anyways, but when we met Clint, you talk about Clint Arthur, right? We sure. met Clint February of uh, last year. So it's been over a year. Obviously, the first thing I said, no, it's not for me. It's for Alexander. It would be much better for him. It would be much better for his um, demeanor and his confidence and for, you know, for everything, right? Because, uh, well, his, I, his social I, skills, too, which have, so, have gone off the chart. Yes, no, absolutely right. And, you know, that's what, um, that's what I think. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just me. I'm pretty sure there's lots of parents like that who would like better for yeah. their kids. And now, that he's so, now that he's so socially adept, uh, I would expect some women to start uh, taking notice in him. <laughs> <laughs> just get ready yeah, for yeah. that if it hasn't it's already happened. happened. Okay, it's yeah. happened. Of course, you're a great catch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wanted to ask, um, uh, dealing with the authorities affected... Uh, you guys, as Alexander was growing up, uh, who are the authorities, and what are you talking about? Uh, like uh, the last time you went to the library, for example. Well, it was actually the fifth and the last time I would ever go to the <laughs> library as a toddler. <laughs> and at that time, it was store time. A whole, I was there with a whole bunch of toddlers playing and singing and dancing around with the guidance of the beautiful, wonderful, sociable, and lovely librarian, Judy. Sounds good and so then, far. And then, silence. The music stops. <laughs> I get angry. I get angry. I yell, I want music. And Judy <laughs> says, it's OK, everybody. La, la, la. La, la, la. And I couldn't handle it. I just keep yelling, I want music! Until I make the whole playroom erupt into an anarchy of children crying and screaming and throwing puzzle pieces every which way and toys everywhere. Did they and want the am, music too? In a way, they did. Uh, so you started a riot. <laughs> I started a riot. An anarchist music. riot. <laughs> That was his future if it wasn't for uh, uh, Arcady intervening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he might be. A, he might be a member of. Uh, I'm not going to say it. That's too political. Sorry, but that's that's awesome. Yeah. Now, now I heard that you speak another language. Um, tell us about that and what you did with it and where it came from and uh, you know which language I'm talking about, right? Yeah, Cleveland <laughs> <laughs> and when did you use day. this and who else spoke it my great friend and mentor marshall silver spoke it it's his hypnosis language oh it's his hypnosis language you didn't just hypnotize us did you i did yes <laughs> I, I did <laughs> But it occurred, but speaking in odd languages like that was one of the many things that my mom, Francine, encouraged me to do in openly play and pursue all of my interests. Oh, that's great. God bless Francine. Tell us what I happened was... to her. Well, Katie, can you go? Uh, yes, sure. Yeah. Um... Well, everything was fine. I just um, I just got another job, which was supposed to be better for all of us, and we we're supposed to take all this to have more time. Um, and um, we did go on vacation. And then one day, when I uh, come home, right, I see that hey, she looks yellow. So I did say, I said, Francine, you look yellow. And that was just uh, you know the sunset. And she said, No, I'm fine. So you do. So that's where our story, unfortunate story, begins, right? And um, we took her to the hospital, and uh, she was diagnosed with a rare cancer, which uh, has like 5% um, survival rate after one year. And unfortunately, also that, you know, usually by the time it's found, it's, it's too late, right? So it's either you have to do some... Uh, 
surgery or, well, surgery. It's called cholangiocarcinoma or bile duct cancer. And that's where our journey began. And like, you know, I've experienced the same also. She's been um, in 10 long months that I've been taking the whole family for a whole to the uh, hospital that was an hour away for the treatment two times a week. And um, so we would spend there sometimes pretty much the whole day. But I was working at the same time, also continental shifts. If anybody knows anything about it, it is working two weeks, nights and two weeks, days, 12 hours. It's seven to eight days a week. So 12 hours, I had to drive there for one hour. So altogether, I would be away for 14 hours from home, seven to eight days every two weeks. Wow. So let, let's fast forward to the point where she where she actually dies. How did that affect you? How did it affect uh, Alexander? Um, it was it was nerve breaking. I still could not believe it. And one thing that uh, so you were a caregiver, day, and you were Alexander's caregiver, uh, and Alexander's how, caregiver. Because how were you doing? Were you a great caregiver, <laughs> or you were just really like, oh my god? I don't know. I guess the the history will tell, and I'm pretty sure uh, you know I'll have to write a book about it because if I can help anyhow to anybody, because it yeah, was a not burnout. to do. Uh, it has been a burnout moment. I mean, that was the time. Also, I started drinking a little bit because mm. that was the only way that I could put myself to sleep. Yeah, I can tell it was a very emotional uh, time in your life and uh, for both of you. But uh, we'll talk more about this, so don't go away. We'll be right back. We are a community of caregivers that understands and supports you wherever you are in your journey. We are a place to connect with other caregivers, but more importantly, a place to get practical, actionable help. There are lots of ways for you to get support. First of all, you can download our welcome pack. This will get you started on your Thrive journey. Next, you can ask and get answers to your questions by posting them here in our private Facebook groups. You can also get live online support by attending one of our live weekly connect webinars. You can get practical, actionable advice by listening to our weekly podcast. You can hear and read other stories about other caregivers' experiences. Plus, add your own in our weekly Share Your Story forum, posted every Tuesday in the Facebook group. You can access essential resources and download practical Thrive Solutions Packs, all of which are geared to help you thrive as a caregiver. You can get lifetime access to all of our resources. Again, we are here to support you and help you thrive and to enjoy your life as a caregiver. And remember, this is a place to get hope, not just cope. And we're back with Alexander and Arkady, and we're talking about special needs. And um, let's, let's bring it back to uh, Alexander now. Um, so tech and computers and, and all of that uh, technology stuff uh, has been your life from a very early age. You said from two was your first uh, computer? Exactly. Wow. So how have they helped you in your childhood education, uh, as well as your parents? I'm assuming somehow it had an effect on them. They have helped me in. Go ahead. They've, they've helped. Go ahead. They've helped. They've helped me in pretty much every way conceivable. They have been for the much of the source of my own childhood education. It's helped me to become very smart about technology, which is really important, which is really the influence behind what I am doing today to help people to thrive in this hugely digital world. And I believe the reason that computers are so important to me is because of my dietary restrictions, my mom, Francine, she homeschooled me for pretty much all of my life until mm. she passed away. And the computer was the, and the computer was a source of much of the materials that she would she be using. She researched a lot and she had a lot of patience for me. Even in those times where where I had challenges with tech, patience was just Francine's thing. <laughs> patience of Job. So how and, old were you during this time? I would say that when I was homeschooled, um, 
first grade would be what I would say like six or seven years old. Mm-hmm. And you and got I was homeschooled and until I, what age? I homes I got homeschooled until I was fourteen. Fourteen, and then did you go back to school? Yes, I did. And how was when that? Fran- was that a transition for you? Uh, never having been in real school before. It was a major. It was a major challenge, but it was worth it. I got to learn a lot of social skills in the process, mm. getting to fit in with regular society. Because being having been homeschooled for the most of my life, it's something that I'm very grateful for. But at the yeah. same time, I was never raised street smart. I'll admit that personally. Right. I was never raised street sheltered. smart. Yep. So how and long did it take you to acclimate to the outside world <laughs> once you started going? Was it a rough year? Or was it a rough two years? Six months? It was a quick process, really. But the whole start of this, the whole start of this was when I applied to go to high school, I met a very nice assess- assessor who was a very nice and sweet lady. Mm-hmm. And she was evaluating me evaluating me for adequacy of adequacy of my skills that I would have learned in the previous grade and based on that she would determine which level of high school that I would go to like then there's a there's applied and then there is academic which is more mm-hmm. of the more of the very 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 you already get to learn some of the more complex stuff right so this lady takes me through all the different assessments. She asked me about my personality and she asked me all these questions. So what do you like to do? Um, I like to use my computer. I like to play music. I like to play guitar, collect records. That, that was me. I was, I was very socially awkward because much of my social experience in the past had been limited to my experience on YouTube, right? I joined YouTube when I was only 11 years old. I was I was uploading over I've uploaded over 500 music videos, and so a lot of my social experience before that had to do with people who are older than me, who are Googles in the music industry, hop, people who like hobnob with Grammy winners and so on and so forth. In my uh, social experience was limited to online. So that experience was a little bit awkward. And Arcady, if I could hand it to you to tell the result of that whole thing. Yeah, so what happened there, right? So um, um, I had to take him to the testing, faci- it's not facility, but it's like a central uh, hub for all the educational, uh, you know, systems. And um, after about three or four hours, I don't remember, like um, the woman calls me over to the, you know, to the side and say, hey, do you know that he's autistic? I'm like, and what? I mean, that was my answer, right? Uh, you know, yes, it's good that everybody talks about it. So I never, believe it or not, I never told Alexander about it, probably at least for a year, a year and a half, anywhere between a year to two years. I never told him anything about it. When I took him to the school, uh, our local school in here, and uh, going through the guidance office. I mean, luckily, the lady was in there a little bit more understanding. I said, you know what, why don't we try? I mean, there's no harm in trying. And I said, sure enough, I said, I'm fine with it. So I was, I was very easy on Alexander in terms of, hey, you know, you'll catch up with whatever you need to catch up. Otherwise, a lot of education going on in the house. I mean, you've been educated. But yes, no, you, you know, it's... Um, it's been a, um, I'm not saying it, it's all rosy, it's been a roller coaster. And, uh, but one of the thing, one of the main reasons I attribute it to the almond based diet, because that made a big difference in him when he was six. After two weeks only, that his behavior changed. I mean, I'm not saying it's like 100%, but it's changed for better. He stopped being agitated. He stopped being very anxious at everything and, even if you don't give him like yesterday or something, it, it, it all goes, he, he would go nuts. Exactly. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I got to go on such a healthy diet when I was only seven years old. When is it, was is only it only the diet, no medication? Uh, no medication. No medication. Wow. No yeah. medication whatsoever. 
But I'm do, grateful. Do for you it. tell people uh, that you're on the autistic spectrum, or there's no need for them to know? I mean, you don't. You don't really. Uh, I mean, people. There's an, always a danger that people will put you in a box and then limit you. You know. Yeah. But thank God nobody put you in a box, or who knows what limits you would have placed on yourself, or your parents would have placed on yourself. Exactly. You know. Oh yeah, no. I mean, that that was that was out of question. I mean, I was you know not knowing anything about it. I didn't want to tell him. I said, I just want him to be yeah. what he was before and just instill more of it in him so to so he would not know about it. Right. Because, I mean, it's the whole system. Very I mean. wise, yeah. Uh, so many parents out there, you know, who are in the position you're in and, and you know, a lot of them don't know what to do. Uh, you listen to the doctor, you know. Doctors uh, can be helpful, but sometimes, you know, they're short-sighted or their goals are different from your goals, you know, like you that, said. That, they just want to label you and they just put a notch on their belt. Well, I just diagnosed this, you know, but, you know, what about the person who has to live that, with that diagnosis yeah. around their neck? Yes, pretty much for their, but, you know, it's not the first time that somebody mentioned about, uh, the, you know, the uh, condition uh, that Alexander has, but... You know, I understand there are different uh, levels, perhaps, of it. Oh, yeah. And I guess the earlier, the earlier we as a parents will interject in a positive way, the better probably the kids will be. Uh, they will be better off. They will be, you know, they will uh, adjust better to the environment and develop, I guess, develop the other sides uh, of their, um, of what they are good at or excellent or genius at. Right. And, and to offset with that the rest of the stuff. Yeah, I love that, that movie Rain Man, you know, with Dustin Hoffman, because here's a guy who is so brilliant, so smart. I mean, a box of toothpicks could fall on the ground, and he would know how many just by looking at them. You know, or he can he can memorize uh, like five decks of cars, you know. That's, that's and, and he was sheltered in this facility. And really, Tom Cruise uh, gave him a life, you know. Yeah, no, that's 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 an awesome movie. I mean, I'm still, I you know, but yes, we lose sometimes memories and everything as we grow up. I mean, Alexander, we have over five thousand vinyl records. Wow, he remembers pretty much. I don't know. I'm asking him. He's in a different room. Do you remember <laughs> all of them? <laughs> pretty much. Pretty <laughs> much all of them. Well, I, I've heard you do your speeches. I mean, how how hard was it for you to memorize your speech? Probably not uh, hard at all, huh? There was some amount of challenge, but the commitment to do the commitment to memorize my speech and rehearse it every day for the for those pretty much thirty days, the commitment was easy. Yeah, getting getting the performance abilities down was the real challenge because I had my dad pushing me out of my comfort zone, yeah. which is one of the big which is one of the big reasons which besides. Lynn Arthur's major help is what has transformed me into the performer and very confident and happy, smiling person that I am today. Well, I've seen him uh, coach you, Clint, and tell you, no, no, I want you to do it this way. You know, and you were very obedient. You would do it, and then you would remember to do it. You know, uh, most people get frustrated and say, oh, no, no, I got it memorized this way. You want me to do it differently? You know, and yeah. and and he might change his mind the next time you do it and say, no, this one would be better. Try it this way, you know, and and yeah. you would just do it. And yeah, that's why uh, he was like, you know, creating like Leonardo da Vinci, sculpting the mo the uh, the statue David, you know, and, and chipping off a little more of this, chipping off a little of that, and you were cooperating. And, and that's yeah. how you are the genius that you are today and the great speaker that you are today. No, it's, it, yeah, it's awesome. I mean, obviously, you have to be flexible, you have to be pliable, and you also, at the same time, you have to be yeah. able to, because it's the, it's the, uh, it's a process. It's not just a key. Yeah, and right? he's a tough coach, and he did not, I don't think he treated you differently than anyone else there, you know. I think he saw that you could rise above your limits. He was pushing you out of your comfort zone. And, uh, you know, a lot of coaches aren't like that. A lot of coaches, oh, you know, I don't want to be too hard on him. He might he might have a nervous breakdown or he might, he might uh, you know, get depressed or something. You know, uh, that's the mentality of today. You know, let's just give everybody a participation award and not 
not reward excellence because someone might get offended. <laughs> that isn't how America was built, I'm sorry. <laughs> We didn't get to the moon with that attitude. <laughs> no, no, that would not be, no, that would be, oh, no, it is, it is, you know, it's, um, you know, it's rewarding to see after a while, I mean, we've been for two years, we've been together, well, we we'll spend more and more time together, obviously, after 2013, uh, but, you know, it, it, you know, it, it hasn't been all, uh, Rosie, right? Yeah. You know, I can't chew gum and talk at the same time, and yet Alexander can listen to three things at once. What's going on in your in your mind when you're doing that, Alexander? I mean, uh, have you ever been tested your IQ to see just how much of your brain you're using? I mean, they say a lot of us use three percent, and and Einstein maybe used four percent. I don't know what the actual number is, but but uh, how? And I can't wait to meet this guy who the smartest man on earth who has a higher IQ than Einstein uh, over at Carnegie Hall. That's yeah. Interesting to have That's you and enough. him have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will understand. <laughs> have, have, you measured his, have you measured his IQ, uh, Arcadia? No, no, no. I don't know. I guess we'll have to. I know I thought about it, right? Yeah, I, I'd love to. Uh, maybe he would, too. Like, well, it, how much of my brain am I using? You know, let, uh, you should get an IQ test and just see just for the heck of it because I don't think he's going to fail it. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't think so. But it's in, yeah, like, yeah, I don't remember who was it, Morgan Freeman, one of the movies was talking about it yeah. in the introduction. So, so what goes on in your brain when you're listening to three things at once? How do you process that? Can How do I process in, that? Can you put I it simply... in words so that we can understand? <laughs> Well, when I'm listening to three things at once, I simply run between them. I simply run between them. I go, what does that I go mean? to one, I run over to one thing, and then I go to the other, and then I go to the third thing because I want to be able to listen to all three things at the same time. To others, it's perceived as noise, but to me, it's perceived as excitement in the greatest way possible. That was, that was me as a kid. That was being a kid. I wanted all sorts of crazy things going on in the room. How long between, like, so you're listening to one thing, how, for how long? Like three seconds, five, five seconds, uh, ten seconds, one minute, before you move on to the next one? 30 seconds to a minute. 30 seconds to a minute. Wow. And do you miss anything when you're at number three and number one's going on, or do you kind of hear it in the background? Uh, are you I getting bits kind of, and pieces of it, or, or do you get the whole thing? I get bits and pieces depending on how loud it is, mm -hmm. right? Because all the things that I had were set at different levels. And I was focused, sometimes Volume I focus on one thing. Yeah, sometimes I focus on one thing, like say, reading something, and then I want to go to the other because I want to have it all at the same time. It's almost like sitting down to dinner. And some people will just eat their vegetables first. <laughs> some people will eat their dessert first. But my <laughs> wife is a gourmet cook, so she tells me, no, 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 because I'll eat one thing at a time. Because, no, you have to eat, take a bite of that, and then take a bite of that, and then take a bite of that, and then, and then it all, all just kind of mixes together yes. like a symphony. And it kind of sounds like that's what you're describing. That well, you perfectly know, I, describes, yeah. But I must... Yeah, I must add that, you know, so he's listening, whatever's well, going on in his head, and he's listening to uh, three of these devices or reads and at the same time, but going from one to another. But the moment, the moment you remove one of them and shut down either TV or the radio, you'll see tonsils, man. <laughs> you'll see, you know, like in that cartoon, man, you'll see yeah. tonsils. I mean, the won't be the end. So that was that was the tough times for Francine, especially because once in a while I would call her up and she said, "Do you hear this?" I said, "Yeah, what's happening?" I said, "I just shut down the radio." I said, "That's it. I cannot take it anymore." <laughs> but you know, it, yeah. it, eventually, eventually it all settled down, and uh, because we cannot really do much of a, I guess, multitasking. Yes, we can walk and think and talk, but doing two things at the same time that require our full attention, 
I doubt it. I don't know. I cannot. Yeah, I, <laughs> the I result know, of that. Ex- yeah. The result I know of you that two are, are Canadian, you know, and I know that the Canadians are just a little different than Americans. They do things differently <laughs> up there. Now, I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, don't read anything into what I'm saying, but I'm curious. Um, this is your father, Arcady, uh, Alexander. And yet you call him Arcady and not Dad. Are you just doing that for the sake of the show, or do you not call him Dad? And if if so, why not? Just curious. Um, in real yeah. life, in real life, in real life, I don't call him Dad. Really? That's been that's been the way it was ever since I was a little baby. Because Where logically, is- you probably figured, well, what's your name, Arcady? Well, that's what I'm going to call you. You know, and it just never occurred to use a, uh, an endearing term like that or whatever, and it just kind of stuck. Because, yeah. you know, start. well, when I was young, I was taught, okay, always say Aunt Diana, Uncle Joe, and this and that. And when we get older, you know, uh, I, I would say, I don't, you know, he's kind of almost my age. I'm not going to call him Uncle Vic. And, <laughs> and, yeah. But it's really hard to stop calling Uncle Vic Uncle Vic because you've been doing it for so long, and you got to really force yourself so is that kind of what's going on there? You've always called him Arcade, so he's Arcade? No, I respect. Uh, no, no, it was actually um, so when Alexander Lady was born, and believe it or not, he, uh, he called Daddy first. That's the first ever word that came out of his mouth. You won't believe and how... Every man loves to hear that. How did it make you feel when he stopped calling you that? I was almost like, you know what, at the time, for, for a moment, I was almost guilty because Francine was so upset. So how come I spent all the time with him and he does not call me, he calls you? <laughs> That's exactly what happened, right? But then again, because I've been working all the time, uh, Francine was a, um, a stay-at-home mom. <laughs> and eventually it happened that Alexander started calling me by my first name, like, you know, who is that guy standing in the entrance? Yeah. So, <laughs> so maybe you brought it on yourself. You should have stayed home more often, but you were busy. With yeah, that would be awesome. But, so, you know, so like, was Francine Francine or was she mom or mommy? Or... She was mommy. Oh. Yes. Okay. I get it. <laughs> so you two sound like you're really good friends and you get along with each other and, and you have mutual respect and admiration for each other. Is that the case? Yes. 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 Great. So what's in the store for the future? What are your plans besides uh, Carnegie Hall? I mean, what are your long-term plans for the great Alexander? Alexander the Great. Alexander the <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> Does anyone know what your plans are, or are you just kind of taking it day by day? Week by week. Uh, for now, we're taking it day by day, and then obviously would like to expose Alexander to even more events after the Carnegie Hall, mm-hmm. and um, then you know we'll go from there. One. So, so Harvard was your first uh, speech on a stage, right? Yes, Harvard Club of Boston. So explain to me um, when you were introduced to Clint, when your dad said, "Hey, I have an idea. We're going to do this." And, you know, you're going to speak at Harvard. And what was going on through your head at first? Were you a little apprehensive? Did you, didn't, were you excited? I mean, t- tell us, you know, that, that process. For finan- for, it was for financial reasons that I was a little bit nervous. But once we got in, I was excited. So you were worried about the monies. What a mature <laughs> young man! <laughs> but you never know that. that. You never doubted you could do it, right? I never doubted, and I I believe that something like this would be on my cards all along. So you were expecting it. I was expecting it. Yes. You know, it's the same. It's the same with me. You know, I, I would see these movies occasionally, and. You know, a movie like Dave and a movie like uh, Fifty First Kisses, a movie like Groundhog Day. And now recently, um, this new movie came out uh, yesterday about the Beatles. Mm. And they all had one common theme in, uh, in, uh, in common. This, this common person who wasn't very special was thrown into a situation where, you know, in the case of Dave, he, he had to imitate the President of the United States because he was a lookalike and the President had a stroke and they didn't want to, you know, uh, t- 
tell anybody yet because the country was in a, a delicate position and and in, in Groundhog Day you have this guy who was a jerk, you know, but he had to live this day over and over and over again and through the process he learned to be a compassionate, loving human being and and uh, there was just something inside of me that said, you know what, Dave, you were born for greatness. I know you just run a gas station and, and now your wife's uh, disabled and you're her caregiver, but one day you're going to be uh, somebody. Not that I wasn't somebody, but I just felt like, you know, something special was going to happen. And I'm finding that that is, is coming to pass, and obviously it's coming to pass for you as well. I think great people, you know, I think uh, Helen Keller knew she was going to be Helen Keller, you know. Uh, I think Einstein knew he was going to be Einstein. There was something inside of them. Uh, otherwise, they never would have got there, right? No. The guiding light. No, that's true, You're right? And and the, the, uh, yes, and the main thing is, you know, there was a time that uh, after one of the times that we uh, got some takeout from the Mandarin restaurant, um, right? It's a Chinese chain in here in Canada, and I get the fortune cookie, and it says on it, "Men do not fail; they give up trying." Uh, fortune cookies. <laughs> I, I like. Wow, I mean, that's kind of like hit me, right? Because I, I kept on, I, I never gave up till the last moment, basically. Till the Do last. Do you have that same attitude, Alexander? I did agree. You in, did you inherit that? Yes, I did. I would, I, I got to tell you, when I was, when I was rehearsing for my speech, I had a never give up mentality and, Going through all these business seminars over the years, and even through all, and especially through all these speaking opportunities, I've learned to adopt that whole mindset more so than I ever did previously in my life. That's one of the biggest things. That's one of the biggest things. Hey, I had no idea where my life trajectory would take me, other than the dreams that were in my head of being, of being somebody. Working with people who are important, you know, like celebrities and people in the music industry, yeah. and I feel that with with this with all these life changing events, that's starting to become more true for me than ever before. You know, you're a good looking guy. Um, you are uh, socially um, adept now. I didn't know who, who you were before. All I know is uh, you now, and you know. Uh, if I were to describe you, okay, you're a little eccentric, but, you know, so is Bill Gates, so is Mark Zuckerberg, so is, you know, uh, a lot of these musicians or actors, but you're you're just normal. And thank, thank your dad and your mom for just listening to that little voice in their head to give you direction because, you know, one wrong turn, one bad decision, one wrong piece of advice you could be like night and day. You could not be who you are today. And I want to encourage everybody out there who has special needs kids. And I can, I know that it's depressing sometimes. Uh, you know, we worry about so much. Oh my God, he's never going to be normal. He's never going to do this. He's never going to do that. He's never going to, you know, uh, acclimate in school. He's never going to have friends. He's never going to find a spouse. I mean, we worry about everything. But 90%, this is a fact, 90% of everything we worry about never comes to pass. And it's just refreshing to hear your story because here's a success story. And you know what? There, other stories can be a success story because this wasn't easy. Didn't, this didn't just happen. This was hard work, blood, sweat, and tears. You know, your yeah. mother uh, gave her life for you. I mean, we don't know why she's gone, but... You know, maybe you needed to, uh, uh, you know, live without her so that your father can step in and be the parent that maybe he never was to you or the parent that your mother was, and you needed to shift gears. You know, God does things in mysterious ways. Yes. And so uh, yes. both of your parents are sacrificing their lives for you. And, and again, that's the American dream. No, you're absolutely right, Dave. You are. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, you just take it day by day and just never give up. 
And <laughs> I mean, uh, one, one thing that I must say that at any, while Francine was sick and I was taking her two times a week uh, to the hospital for treatments for 10 months, every single time, every single moment that I had there at work, by the computer, I would go and try to search something. I did find, I mean, it's not a cure. It's just something that has been used in the past. The, the patent ran out and some people used it and some other organizations finally did, you know, they, they developed something like that that um, could be used and um, provide 50% better effect of the drugs that usually pumped into everybody who's, uh, who, who ended up with a cholangial carcinoma. But in the end, you know, I would, I always would thought, I said, you know what, if I can think of it, somebody else thought about it. Let me just go and find it. And thank God for the internet. I mean, we're talking. Uh, we can find stuff. And we just have to, you know, search through it. Well, you know, um, it's, it's, it's really amazing. What, Alexander, what, what do you feel like you inherited from your mother? And what do you feel like you inherited from your father? And you take great pride because these traits or these qualities or these personalities came from them. Can you uh, pinpoint that? One of the biggest things that I feel that I inherited from my mom, Francine, was her flair for creative artistry and being and willing to go all out and, and, and the ability to write and really express myself, right? Because those were the skills that she that, that she was most well known for. And those were the skills that it bring a lot to my business today. And as for my dad, and as for my dad, who I've been having, spending a lot more time with, it's his never ending ambition to pursue the bigger things in life. And as I said, that's becoming more and more true for me with every passing month, every passing day, as our throughout our adventures together. That's great. He had a great vision for you, and uh, and he had the courage and the chutzpah to walk it out, to hop on a plane if necessary, to leave his country if necessary, whatever it took. I wanted to ask you one last question because we're running out of time. Um, yeah. You have, uh, you said something about a tradition that... Um, that helped Francine to thrive in her final months and how you're reviving it. What is that all about? Go ahead, Alexander. Well, what it was, was when Francine was in her final months, we actually started up an Etsy store where she sold all sorts of her favorite craft items. And Daddy was, con and Daddy was constantly working to ship all the items. It was her chance to express herself. She knew she was in her dying days and she wanted to make the most of them. And it was in, and it was a thriving business. I mean, what you could were say they gave, that she was making. She 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 was selling she was selling fabric items and other handmade crafts. Like the one behind you? You could say that. But in yeah. any case, but, but in any case, as a result of this, of this whole thing, getting to explore her creative potential and monetizing it, that I would say is probably one of the things that made her, allowed her to actually stay for a few extra weeks. Mm. And now we are reviving, and now we are reviving that tradition. Seven years later, mm. we are relaunching her store. We're not selling the same products, mind you, uh -huh. but we are continuing the tradition that helped her to thrive even in those fateful final months. And we are helping others to thrive by being by pursuing the same interests that we that we are grateful for and that really, really speak to speak about who we are. Yeah. And in doing so, we are spreading we are, we are we are spreading awareness of the great cause that we that we plan on contributing to. We are supporters of the Cholangio Carcinoma Foundation, which mm. and bowel duct cancer, cholangio carcinoma, that is the disease that Francine passed away of. Mm. So it sounds like she was an entrepreneur. I wonder if she knew it beforehand. 
but uh, obviously you inherited your entrepreneurial spirit from her as well. So tell us about your business, your triple digital, what is it? <laughs> you, got too many, you, you got too many words in your name. You got to cut that down. Let me see. Triple, <laughs> digital, triple digital marketing. Did I leave something out? Yeah. What? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander can take it away. He's... Yes, tell but us the about your business. But the whole meaning behind the triple agent name is that agent. They're there are guys that do SEO, there are guys that do social media branding, there are guys that do graphic design, there are guys that do your social media marketing. Well, what we do, I simply call it the ABCs of digital marketing. A, advertising, organic or paid on Google. B, branding and managing online reputation management to get your work as good online as you do offline. And C, content is the king. Content marketing is the queen, and it develops okay. social proof. It, with these three specialties, we're like three agencies in one. We call ourselves triple agents, and the whole goal of what we do is to help great entrepreneurs and experts position them as leading authorities in their fields and help them to thrive with the same strategies that we use to thrive ourselves. Make their message heard. Get them exposed to a wider audience, right? Because you can't be a best kept secret. <laughs> You're going to be bankrupt. Amen. Well said. Yes, well said. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> yeah. Well, he must be the spokesperson of the business. Yes. <laughs> and the brains of the operation. Um, well, I can't believe how fast this hour has gone. Um, yes. I. You know, why don't you uh, tell us how we can get a hold of you? You have a website or email or something. How do you want people to, prospective clients, to contact you? You can simply, I have, my personal website is alexandervilichko.com. However, if you want to sign up with me and get a hop at a free consultation so we can discuss business goals and analyze opportunities and challenges and weaknesses that are holding you back from successful in getting you where you need and getting you where you want, you can simply go to my website, which is tripleagentdigitalmedia.com. There is a link to book a free consultation. You can easily do it. It's, a, it's in a web calendar format. You can book a date and time, and it's going to be about 20 minutes or so. I'm going to review all of your business goals and put together an analysis for you to see where you can grow. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and the phone numbers we do have for Canadian uh, uh, listeners, it's 289-500-8883. For the U.S., it's 718-501-0788. And we do have an 800 number. Do you remember, Alexander, what's the 800 number? It is A33TADMSCO. What are the letters again? TADMSEO. And does that stand for something? Triple Agent Digital Media uh. Search Engine Optimization. Great number. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a vanity number that we bought. You should see if they have a, a domain name in that uh, as well. And then you'll yeah. be all set. Oh, we do have many domains. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> that. <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on the show. And um, this is the Caregiver Dave show. And I'm Caregiver Dave. And our website is caregiverdave.com. We have three free gifts for all of you at caregiverdave.com. Check it out. No obligation. And until next time, I just want to say thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you for listening to the Caregiver's Caregiver radio program with Dave Nassani. 